Hello, and welcome to our sixth annual ADHD Symposium. This annual event is made possible thanks to the ongoing partnership between CHKD and Chesapeake Bay Academy. We are pleased to be able to offer this resource on ADHD to our community of parents, educators, and clinicians. And thank you for joining us today. My name is JD Ball, and this session I will be covering enhanced executive functioning. Just to make a quick uh, description about the uh, relationship between ADHD and executive functioning, I'd like to remind you that an earlier speaker at a CBA ADHD symposium identified ADHD as an executive functioning disorder. Of course, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for ADHD can be faulted for having not emphasized executive functioning. The DSM-5 bases the diagnosis on its childhood origins, uh, the developmental inappropriate quality of ADHD symptoms, evidence of those symptoms in multiple settings and functional interference or impairment. Uh, the DSM-5 goes out of its way to say that there is no biological marker for ADHD, but it does allude to um, the biological basis in frontal lobe dysfunction as evidenced by uh, several areas of neuroscience, neuroimaging, neurotransmitter involvement, genetic influences, and neurofunctional correlates. And of course, those neurofunctional correlates are executive dysfunction. ADHD is not your best friend forever, but the good news is that you can achieve enhanced executive functioning. So everyone benefits from enhanced executive functioning, but those with ADHD really need it. Another one of our previous uh, keynote speakers, Ned Hallowell, has talked about managing ADHD in several terms. And one of the most important is that it's necessary first to understand what ADHD is. And those of you who have heard me talk before know that I spend a lot of time trying to help people understand ADHD um, as the first step in managing it. But it takes a team, uh, generally uh, a number of adults for children get involved in uh, helping to manage the ADHD symptoms. It's always important for those managers to see the humor and in fact, some assets that are associated with having ADHD. And it's necessary always to adjust expectations because acceptance of ADHD is really key to avoiding humiliating or criticizing or um, having a negative impact on the self-esteem of people with ADHD. ADHD and, and executive dysfunction generally are lifelong problems, developmental problems, and they're associated with, as we've noted, frontal lobe executive dysfunction, frontal lobe mediated uh, executive dysfunction. You can uh, also speak about ADHD in terms of uh, critical periods in development when it manifests differently. In very young children, it's almost always manifested as hyperactivity. Whereas in older children and in adolescence, it begins to be seen in terms of both executive dysfunction or mental inattentiveness and hyperactivity. And in adults, uh, it's almost always seen primarily by the uh, executive dysfunction or the cognitive elements. Interestingly, we have not seen a lot of literature yet on what happens in old age with ADHD, but because um, growing older is associated with its own diminution of executive functioning, 
we can expect uh, ADHD to have additional uh, cognitive or inattentive type symptoms in the elderly. This is an old slide from an insurance company, um, but uh, you can see here that there is an emphasis in adolescence on missing frontal lobe dysfunction uh, as a developmental phenomenon. In other words, because the frontal lobes are the last part of the brain to develop, uh, adolescents typically show symptoms of executive dysfunction, at least until they mature. And of course, this has an impact on driving, which was the basis for this um, pretty cool slide from an insurance company some years ago. So ADHD is developmental by nature, meaning that it changes over the course of development and it arises uh, out of developmental uh, immaturity in effect. Frontal lobe maturation takes about 25 years. As we've said, um, late adolescence, young adulthood is the period with fastest and um, sort of the most complete frontal lobe maturation. Until then it is delayed and incomplete. And interestingly, when we look at symptoms of ADHD, particularly during these transition uh, periods, uh, those symptoms can make a person appear to be immature. In fact, some have said that a person with ADHD uh, sort of behaves as though they were 30% younger than they actually are, at least until we get into full frontal lobe development at around young adulthood. So the uh, third grade or eight to nine year old period is a peak age for referral to clinicians for diagnoses of ADHD, uh, primarily because it is at this point where it begins to interfere most with academic functioning. But we see uh, symptoms manifest again in middle school when there is an increased demand for keeping up with changing classes and teachers and picking up books out of uh, lockers in the hallway between classes and in effect uh, a greater demand for academic organizational skills. We see problems again as uh, young people head off to college and are then responsible for um, their own meals, their own laundry, their own checkbooks and any number of executive functioning tasks that were previously handled by parents for them. And of course, uh, as young people marry or begin work or live alone, we get new kinds of uh, transition difficulties. And as I've mentioned, I think we're going to begin to see um, particular difficulties that can arise in retirement and old age, those have not been specified, but it's not difficult to begin speculating about what they might be. Um, so adapting to executive dysfunction can involve um, several different domains of adaptation. There are things that a person can do for themselves, uh, biologically, psychologically, and in terms of self-care. There are things that uh, this team of support people can do to help, and they can include um, mental health providers, uh, family members, uh, the uh, provider that might be prescribing medication, um, teachers, coaches, and we'll talk about some of those things. And there are ways that the environment itself can be changed to make life more flexible, to, um, well, to have other people in an environment be more flexible. People with ADHD generally do better with more structure. But school and workplace and environmental changes can also be a help. If um, people responsible for shaping that environment are wise enough to understand what it is that people with ADHD may need. Russell Barkley talks about this as scaffolding uh, or setting up a structure to enhance ADHD functioning. An important element of all of this is that executive functioning is a whole brain business. 
it is uh, not a unique area of the brain. We talk about executive dysfunction as arising from the frontal lobes, but as you see in this slide, uh, that systemic influence it occurs throughout the uh, brain and uh, involves nearly all aspects of cortical functioning. So executive functioning has been misunderstood as a singular thing. And one of the things we're gonna talk about today is the many ways in which it can be manifested. So in talking about biological management, um, primary treatments are medication. Stimulant medication, meaning uh, typically medications uh, like Adderall and uh, other stimulants, Ritalin in particular, uh, are 80% effective. These are dopaminergic neurotransmitters that enhance executive functioning in the frontal lobe. These benefits are temporary and all medications have side effects. So there are drawbacks to medications, uh, but with an 80% efficacy, um, there is certainly a reason for anyone with ADHD who has a um, well-determined diagnosis to consider this as one of a package of things that they may do for these symptoms. Systematic behavior management is almost always helpful. It's less effective alone than psychopharmacology, but it's always used in some form or another. Um, often in ways that are not particularly sophisticated, but in the hands of a uh, psychologist to oversee the management behaviorally, uh, there can be very sophisticated systematic behavior management that is positive and highly beneficial. Some of you may have heard of neurofeedback. This is basically uh, modifying electroencephalographic activity, learning to manage EEG by getting feedback about what EEG is being manifested. The theory behind this is that ADHD is associated with slower brainwave processing. And when EEG can be um, picked up a little bit, which is exactly what stimulants help happen, a person might be able to learn to um, manipulate their own EEG and make it uh, a little faster paced beta wave EEG. And when they do symptoms of ADHD begin to diminish. Um, this is a promising approach. Uh, it has not been definitively demonstrated through double blind placebo research. Uh, but there are many studies um, that have demonstrated it on a sort of weaker methodological basis with self-selected patients. Um, and one of the things that uh, I discerned from reading that literature is that like a lot of other learning paradigms, this may be uh, best for children with the strongest learning uh, capacities gifted children or twice exceptional children, uh, for example, uh, might be particularly uh, able to make use of EEG biofeedback. And it's worth exploring um, if uh, you really are opposed to using stimulant medication. Psychotherapy can be effective for problems that are associated with ADHD, such as depression and anxiety. Uh, but it has been minimally effective uh, for the core symptoms of ADHD itself or for the executive dysfunction. Uh, mental hygiene is important. Sleep habits um, are important. Better sleep enhances executive functioning. So uh, things that we know not to do, um, like late evening chocolates, uh, stimulant medicine at bedtime, caffeine, um, not getting involved in uh, blue light electronics uh, late at night and ruling out sleep apnea if a person snores are all important ways to ensure that sleep is adequate. 
Um, good diet is, of course, beneficial, but there has not been very uh, definitive research. In fact, there's no evidence for ideas that sugar and various dyes are responsible for ADHD symptoms. In individual cases, possibly, but um, on the whole, those theories have been disputed. Exercise is very important for symptoms of ADHD and executive dysfunction, and we're going to talk a little further about that. Uh, exercise is linked to the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Uh, these are basically uh, miracle grow substances for frontal lobe brain development. In fact, uh, we're learning that the production of BDNF can help stem uh, early Alzheimer's or symptoms of dementia for the elderly. It's very important to keep up BDNF production in the brain. And this is generally done best through exercise. Early morning exercise is important for people in school. It stimulates um, better cognitive functioning through the day. And that has implications for when schools might want to be scheduling PE, particularly for the kids who have ADHD. Exercise stimulates frontal lobe executive functioning on a short-term basis. There's lots of studies that demonstrate that young adults perform better on things like the Stroop neuropsychological test after they've been engaged in an acute period of exercise. And some recent research even demonstrates a dose effect so that more exercise begets uh, more enhanced executive functioning. Structured exercise is interesting because it engages um, executive functioning sometimes through the directions that people are given. You can think of the old uh, Simon Says kinds of exercises where a person has to do what Simon says and has to be careful um, to be sure Simon said to do it before they do it. Um, that is a kind of go, no go instruction. So move, don't move, move this muscle, don't move that muscle. Um, are interesting um, practice um, exercises in executive function because you're in effect using the frontal lobes of the brain to direct which muscle activities you engage in when. And uh, that's exactly what um, uh, is enhancing executive functioning is to practice it. And in the same way, sports participation teaches kids to run certain plays, to um, look for um, the basketball player who is in the open um, to the extent that uh, a child is learning to play the game as a pattern in an organizational sense. They are uh, learning to exercise executive functioning and uh, inhibit some motor behaviors while permitting others. So this is also um, very interesting um, direct engagement in physical executive functioning that can be a wonderful means of uh, enhancing uh, skills for younger kids learning to mature faster with executive functioning. Sports require these uh, brief periods of concentration. Uh, I should say sports that require those brief periods of concentration may be best for people with ADHD. You'll see uh, baseball players uh, chewing gum staring at the clouds, um, picking daisies, and then engaging intensely as um, the pitcher is finally ready to throw the pitch. And these are the kinds of things that um, people with ADHD can do is focus very intently for a short period. It's just the uh, sort of ongoing, slow, constant uh, concentration that is difficult for them. So games that permit this sort of uh, immediate focus, even uh, golf, where you really only need to be concentrating heavily in the 30 seconds of uh, making a shot, uh, are uh, good examples of uh, sports that may suit uh, these kids well. Now, um, I might talk here about ADHD coaching, not because this kind of coaching is like sports coaching, but just because it sort of um, associates 
Um, in ADHD coaching, essentially someone with good executive functioning, it could be said to be lending some frontal lobe executive functioning to the person with poor executive functioning. And this is widely used uh, whether or not it is formal. Almost anyone with ADHD has been coached by someone at some time and often by many people frequently. It's widely used, it's broadly defined, it's variably applied, it's scarcely researched, and coaches may range from parents and peers to paid consultants. Uh, of note, they are not regulated by healthcare uh, license authorities, and uh, it is important to look very carefully at the qualifications of people doing this kind of coaching. Um, but it is unquestionably helpful in the right hands. Uh, executive functioning, as I mentioned, is a complex topic with lots of sub skills involved. It's not a single mental activity. It is a cluster of many, perhaps as many as a dozen. Here, I'm going to highlight some of the main skills that the neuropsychological community has consensus about with regard to um, their role in executive functioning. One is inattention, meaning that a person is mentally inattentive to the task at hand on frequent occasions. Uh, one of the ways to enhance that is simply to cue the person to get back on task. This is best when it is subtle and not when it is sort of nagging, although it is difficult um, to offer cueing without nagging. And uh, this has brought up uh, all sorts of interest on my part and on the part of others in various ways we might electronically cue someone uh, with a buzzer, with a vibration on their iPhone or on their iWatch or some means to get back on task that is subtle and a little bit less um, interpersonally uh, provocative. Of course, you can reward someone intermittently for getting back on task using systematic behavior management, uh, but you do want to avoid scolding or punishment, and you never want to humiliate. Um, you know, comments like, uh, you are always off task are not helpful. Uh, comments that basically label the person and um, fail to offer much help, uh, simply remind them of their own uh, limitations and, and that's never helpful. But we wanna minimize distractions. And one of the ways to do that is to simply join in. An example would be if you were trying to get a younger child to pick up their toys, you might have a long drawn out battle of redirecting, 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 and talking, talking, talking to get them to pick up their toys when this whole process would go way smoother if you jump on the floor and start picking up the toys with them and make sure you get them involved in helping. Uh, then it goes quickly. Everybody feels like they're working as a team and there's a lot less negative interchange. Another executive functioning skill is the ability to inhibit, to not do something that um, you were impulsively inclined to do. Again, you cue self-regulation. Wait, wait, think, think, stop before you act, please. You reward deliberation and you emphasize accuracy over speed. So if a child had a homework assignment and was very proud to have finished it, and lickety split speed, um, your interest is in its accuracy, um, not its impulsivity. And so you um, offer whatever positive reinforcement may be offered for accomplishing this task on the basis of accuracy rather than speed. Again, you're gonna avoid punishment and avoid humiliation. And again, you can help best sometimes by just joining in and showing how to inhibit. Working memory is a third executive functioning skill. 
And it refers to the ability to recall something over a short period of time, particularly uh, memory of things you were planning to do. So it helps to give brief instructions. If you gave a child um, three things to do when he gets up to his bedroom, the odds are he'll do one or none by the time he gets to the top of the stairs. Give him a short list. Um, you can think of the term use two to do's, no more than two. What's the main thing you're going up there to do? Uh, you cue with picture prompts and again, perhaps electronic memory aids. And you can show how by talking aloud. When I go up to the head of the steps with things to do, I try to remember what it was I was going up there for. Uh, planning and organizing is a whole nother executive skill. And of course it can be argued that this has many sub skills, but uh, this is a um, area in which executive dysfunction manifests intensely. Uh, the ways you can enhance planning and organizing is by asking someone to think about it ahead of time. How are you going to do this? Address the feeling of being overwhelmed. I know it feels like you've got a lot of different things to keep up with, but let's just concentrate on what you're going to do first. So you break tasks into parts. How might this book report be broken into steps? What would be the steps in doing a book report? And you set priorities. What do we do first? What's the most important thing? You talk aloud. Here's what I might do. At this point, I might be thinking about doing this. What's first? How do we keep track? And you remind the person of prior successes. I remember a time when you had a big project and you pulled it off really well. Let's think about what you did then. Time sense. Uh, folks with uh, executive dysfunction have some difficulty with time awareness. They don't know easily what time it is, how much time a task is going to take, uh, how much time they've spent at it already. They tend to get lost in an activity. And ironically, uh, they can seem not to have ADHD because they spend hours and hours at doing something. But this is partly because they have no sense of how long it has been since they began. So these kinds of questions are helpful to cue time awareness. And again, you can build in time checks and uh, think aloud about managing time. And this may be one of those areas where we can um, develop some kind of uh, means of cueing people electronically as to uh, time cues. Uh, in the school environment, we have learned um, that we minimize distractions best in small classrooms with high teacher ratios. And I have to tell you, uh, this is something that has been going on at Chesapeake Bay Academy uh, since its founding for over 30 years. Uh, trying to keep the ratio of teachers to students high uh, is probably uh, uh, the most important thing that we do. It uh, means that teachers learn from students and students um, can demonstrate their individual learning preferences this way. Uh, this is the key to individualized teaching and to avoiding overwhelming stimuli. But on that topic, uh, we find that giving students paperwork in which there's more white space on the printed page uh, is helpful. It keeps down the sense of uh, a very dense um, assignment that they feel overwhelmed by before they begin and instead uh, boosts the sense that I can handle this. There are only a few things on this page. Uh, encouraging peer support, highlighting strengths and engaging in various academic innovations. These are all keys to the school environment. Frankly, these are all assets at CBA. Uh, and here you see a few specific CBA activities, makerspace, culinary arts, um, the technology emphasis and entrepreneurship are all things that CBA has been doing. 
You should know I'm biased. I'm on the board of trustees at Chesapeake Bay Academy and I've chaired its education committee for many years. Um, now, probably the single most important thing um, about all of these executive functioning skills is the way in which they can come together under the term metacognition. This is a critical executive functioning skill and to the extent that it can be taught directly, uh, it's of great help to children with ADHD. And this is particularly beneficial and it, uh, adolescents and when uh, children become capable of thinking about thinking. So there are lots of ways to foster metacognition, including having um, a person talk aloud about their own thinking and modeling that for them, asking questions about thinking. How might we best think about doing this project? Uh, what do we need to be thinking while we're doing the project? Is that thought that you're having right now helpful to getting this project accomplished or not so helpful? Um, here we're talking in part about mindfulness and frankly, uh, direct training in mindfulness can be beneficial because it is um, in a way training metacognition. There are games that um, you can play that involve thinking aloud, planning aloud, planning with people. Um, and all of this is um, a focus on the process of learning, not just the product. Uh, how do we go about learning something and getting something done? Uh, breathing mindfully and so on. There is a book by Donna Wilson and Marcus Conyers called Drive Your Brain. This is a nice metaphor. It um, basically reminds students that in enhancing executive functioning, we're trying to teach students to drive their own brains, to engage in metacognition strategies, to think about thinking, plan activities, and uh, have lesson ideas. Um, interestingly, uh, metacognition is the number one shared characteristic of academic high achievers. That is people who do well in school exercise metacognition well. And this has been based on a meta-analytic research review of 91 studies. Um, so it's a very important uh, talent and uh, it can be learned. Um, so teachers can teach for metacognition by teaching students to think about thinking to basically speak aloud their cognitive strategies and focus on what those strategies will be, to regulate themselves in terms of their emotional and um, behavioral impulsivity um, distractions, and to focus on other people in an interpersonal understanding. So in this way, um, metacognition relates to social emotional learning as well as to cognitive learning. But teachers can also teach with metacognition, meaning that they reflect on their own teaching approach and outcomes. They ask themselves, um, what am I doing that is helpful? What am I doing that is not so helpful? Um, when any of us engage in examining our own behavior, our own thinking, we're engaging in metacognition. And to the extent that we're willing to be self-analytical at times, uh, we will um, typically accomplish goals with more efficiency. So um, to teach for metacognition, what teachers would do is make metacognition explicit, teaching students how to learn, that is by thinking about thinking, helping students to know their own learning characteristics. What am I best at? How do I learn best? When do I think best? What helps me think best? What do I need to do to set up a circumstance in which I will think best? And you encourage problem-specific strategies. You have students show their work. That tells them how they think, but they're showing their work to themselves. 
as well as to teachers. And the purpose for it is to illustrate for them how they think. So when you work a math problem and you show your work, you're reminding yourself how to do the problem and you're demonstrating to yourself where you make the error, if there is one. You teach students to manage time. You facilitate student planning, monitoring, and evaluating. And you help students acquire personal mindfulness. Methods for teaching for metacognition enhancement include using metacognition personally, thinking about best teaching, making metacognition explicit, using terms like driving the brain or using metaphors to help someone see what you mean by thinking about thinking. And you demonstrate it. You talk aloud, you problem solve aloud, you self-correct aloud, and you ask questions. And when you see students engaged in metacognition, you catch them and point that out to them. Now, see, now you're thinking about metacognition. Now you're thinking about thinking. See how that helps. You lead discussions of metacognition examples. So a metacognition uh, project uh, might be associated with these kinds of questions. What's the most important thing we're going to do in this project? What steps will we take? What are the parts of the project? So which steps are first and second and what needs to be done at each time? And how might you do this? How much time are you gonna have? How will you know if you're getting it done? What strategies are best and how can you break the time up? So all of these ideas are pertinent to metacognition and at older ages, metacognition is the most important focus for enhancing executive function. To drive their brains, students must engage in driver education. They must learn how to select a route, how to look ahead, how to keep their eyes on the road, how to drive past distractions, and how to estimate their arrival time, when to speed up or slow down, and when to back up. And so when a student asks you, uh, why do I need to learn this? Generally, the best answer is if it's in the curriculum and has been there because professional educators have appreciated its value for hundreds of years and they put it in the curriculum, the answer is probably because this will help you change your brain. And changing your brain may be more important than doing the skill, the particular skill we're learning. Uh, and this is the whole uh, essence of enhanced executive functioning. We're trying to help a person change a brain that is associated with weaker frontal lobe executive functioning. Well, that concludes this talk. And I wanna thank you again for attending this year's annual ADHD symposium made possible by CHKD and Chesapeake Bay Academy. For more information and additional resources for parents, educators, and clinicians, please visit cba-va.org slash ADHD. That's our webpage, cba-va.org slash ADHD and chkd.org for resources and for ADHD medical providers. Thank you very much.